Hello, hello, lovely people. Welcome to the Funky Marketing Show. Today, uh, it's one of, let's call it around 20 episodes where I'm gonna do a solo episodes and talk about the things we do, why do we do them, problems we're seeing in the companies, how we are solving them, and give you some tips and trips of how you can implement that. So today I'm going to share with you how to create the B2B content marketing machine out of your business, something that we are done even, we have done even before I started Funky Marketing and something that keeps uh, getting us uh, the new clients, our ICPs inbound. But before that, uh, time to watch the funky intro and dance a little bit. So I guess we can do it. We can do it together this time. So let's do it. Here we go. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's nice to be back to do the live streaming again after a whole week of traveling. I was visiting um, DigiTalk, the conference uh, held in Niche as just a participant to talk with people, hang out, get a few potential clients. Then um, I moved for a day and a half to my hometown to see my family. And I just got back from uh, Tirana, Albania, from Allweb. You can see the T-shirt. Uh, I want to give uh, the whole team uh, credit for organizing a uh, super uh, good event. With uh, you know, I was surprised. Tirana is uh, full of enthusiasm. Uh, when you go to the streets, you get like the positivity uh in the air and uh what is uh actually the thing that that gets me interested is the the you know uh the sense to care you know and it's the whole city that is building the whole country unlike the other the, the majority of other balkan cities uh like it seems that uh they they have the optimism I don't see that in other Balkan cities. Uh, I mean, in the majority of them. But anyway, the conference was great. Uh, I was talking about how to create demand and help B two B companies differentiate. Uh, got a really great feedback. Got to spend time with some nice people. Uh, other speakers, say hi to all of them. Uh, and but anyway, let's get to uh, to the topic that we have. Uh, for today, and that's how to create the B2B content, content marketing machine. So um, when somebody asks me that, I always say it's it's a great question because I feel like, you know, we are still living in times when B2B is sort of like mystical. You know, we sort of see it still, it's changing, but, I, you know, majority of people still see it as uh, something that's generic, unoriginal, slow, without personalities. Um, and I guess that's why it's, it's like mystical, right? But some things have changed and there are people behind every single company, especially in technology. There are people building that technology. They are not working with objects like two and a half, three years ago when I was asking people the questions before I started Funky Marketing, just to note, like I talked with around 260, 270 people uh, before I actually started to focus funky marketing on B2B. Like, and I saw some repeating patterns. I saw that there's a gap in the industry that I can fill in with what I know, what I've been doing strategies from B2C. And um, a lot of companies was were looking at, uh, you know, 
the accounts as like the factory company a building not the account when there's a, a buying committee inside the account inside the company people in different positions that affects the decision making uh, and you need to actually communicate with them so uh, i think this is changing but it's still present in some in some of the b2b industries so the thing that you should always know if we're not working with objects Although we tend to forget that we're working with and marketing to humans, to people, and it's the core of everything. So in B2B, it takes uh, a little bit longer than in B2C to sell something uh, because of the multiple reasons, right? Longer implementation and onboarding time, expensive product uh, or services, uh, ex existing vendors, decision-making processes in the companies, then... Um, there are also biases that affect decision making. For example, like if somebody who is CMO and needs to get a tool uh, to help his team be better, he will go and uh, find the best one. The best one, when you Google it, that's the best one. Maybe that's not the best fit, but if they fail, he has an excuse to say, uh, you know, I got us the best one. You can go and Google it yourself and you will see. So, um, not uh, something that um, you should forget when you think uh, about how you should do marketing and how decisions are being made in the company. It all affects the speed of the buyer's journey. Uh, and not only that, the companies create content. I think I feel still like B2B companies do that, create content for the search engines, not for people. Content there is not consumable. If you go to their websites, there are tons of blog posts that are not unique, no, don't give unique perspective on anything. They are built for the search engines and it's a copy of the content that you can find everywhere. So this is the thing to, to consider and to think about. So um, the thing is uh, that it's not consumable. You know, if you go over there and you want to read it, it's not clear. You don't have the, the clear path through the article. Um, I mean, in time, sure, it will probably bring traffic. But will the traffic be right? Will it bring decision makers and people who can influence their decisions? Hardly. Because if you want to go to the specific people, you go before they have the intent, before they go to Google. Like five years ago, we were on, all on Google. There were no social media, there were no communities, you couldn't do anything differently. But today, things have changed. So that's why we need to go fast. We have speed, which is one advantage that we can have over the others, especially if looking for a small tech company or like a company like Funky Marketing that does marketing for those companies. So it takes us to the moment when we realize that distribution of the content is probably more important than the content itself more important than branding. And in fact, it affects branding in a positive way. And I don't want to uh, go against content cause like having great content is essential. So that's not negotiable. But if you don't have the distribution, nobody will see your content, nobody will read it. So you have to think, you think about that. And uh, let's see what, uh, what else we can get, we can get in there, uh, kind of try to explain it, the, 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 the starting position. So from B2C, like B2B is learning how to use branding and emotions to make the content more personal. And when you create a great content machine for distributing that content, well, you're focused on the long-term goals. And when you don't measure each and every piece of the content, and that's uh, where you don't get just long-term results. You don't have to wait that long to kind of get the results. You get those results in a short term because your strategy is focused on creating a relationship not to get the transaction, not to get the content, uh, the, the contact, you know. Uh, I've been always a person that invested hard in brand and content, even the personal brand. That's how I got all the jobs that I have before, all of them, all the companies came to me inbound. This is what I do now as I run funky marketing. All the clients come to us inbound. So um, 
I also worked uh, for a couple of years on the other side in performance marketing, I think in 2018, 19. Uh, we did some really, um, I would say like we pioneered some things here in the Balkans, which is, uh, you know, marketing automation, email marketing, website personalization. We could track like uh, if you click the ad or the email and you're coming to the website, depending on the industry, like the copy on the website changes, the photos on the website changes, the CTAs changes, the testimonials, uh, a lot of things. So uh, we, I got at those depth and I realized that I know, don't need all of that. You know, so um, I used all of that to kind of create a, a unique perspective and I use that to create a content machine for Farky Marketing and I do the same for the clients. So basically we use um, research and strategy, combine it with creatives to uh, help B2B companies create demand for the way customers buy now, today, which is a lot different than what they have been doing before. So um, I'm sharing with you today uh, the way we manage content, the way we distribute it, the way we repurpose it, the way we optimize it. In other ways, in other uh, words, the way we create a B2B content marketing machine. So uh, I usually uh, go and start with defining the main content pillars of the content that we are creating. Um, and that's my main starting point. Then I have distribution, then I have repurposing. But let's start from the very beginning. So before we get into actually creating content, there's a step zero or minus zero where we find out to whom we are talking to and whom we are for whom we are creating that content. Uh, and that's why the first thing is to determine the clients, you know, the persona, stage of awareness they're in. You know, I want to get to know our ICP. If I have a chance, like I did before I started Funky Marketing, I want to have conversations with them. I want to call them and get them on the call because it's not the same if I find the research or whatever it is and if I talk to them uh, directly. So I can ask them directly the questions that I need to find out, like uh, how is decision-making process held in the company? Where do they go to get educated? Do they already have a vendor? How did they find that vendor? Uh, you know, how long are the contracts? Um, those kind of things. Like when they, sp which are the platforms when they spend their times? Do they go to some offline events? Like all those things are extremely important. Uh, so I can get to know them in depth and I can actually create the strategy around it. Without it, it's just like shooting in the dark. Let me um, grab a sip of coffee. Mm. Yeah, because I use these chances to kind of, you know, like drink coffee with uh, with all of you. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's let's continue. So uh, the thing that uh, that for me is extremely important, and I don't want to get that much into customer research, uh, but uh, finding getting to know your customers and getting to know your audience is extremely important for finding the right topics and themes that we're going to cover with our content, you know, with people that have no idea that they have a problem nor that they have a solution. We're coming up with, you know, like drawing a different perspective, a dream, a bigger picture, just to get them to think about what do they need to get there about the problem or about a frustration. So we need to have a burning problem, something that they really want to solve. Without that, we don't have a service and we don't have a problem. That's extremely important. So when they realize that they have a problem, then it's time to talk about the solution to their problem. So we're talking about the services that we are providing that can help them solve the problems. And you know, at the end, we have those that already have a problem. They know that they have a solution. Uh, and basically, we are giving them the details. People in this stage are ready to buy. They are just waging between different options. So we need to tell them why they should you know, hire funky marketing and not somebody else. And 
a lot of companies are making mistakes talking only to those people that are already on the market to find the solution. You need to go before that and get those that are not in the market right now. Those are less than 5% of the companies that are on the market. So you will certainly get there. But what if you can get like the 95% of them? That would be nice, right? So for us, ideal, ideal clients are CEOs and executives uh, of companies uh, between, you know, it all depends now, but I usually like to go uh, between 50 and 200 employees, scale-ups that has a USP, has product market fit, old enough to have a good culture uh, and a marketing team. So in some cases, we're even okay to work with a company that doesn't have uh, a marketing team, basically, to, to so we can be that team for them. And, you know, sometimes, from time to time, we like to go on a train with a startup just to be able to see where things are going in the dirt. Usually, that's a consulting gig when I get uh, to help them with some of the things to set up the, the foundation. So uh, we are connecting, as you see, like the goals, the personas, and the content here. So when we have a strategy, we go and we create a plan. So the thing that is extremely important, and I cannot uh, you know, emphasize this enough, is that strategy without implementation basically does mean everything. And a lot of B2B companies, including the agencies, are just extremely good with tactics. They cannot see the big picture. They cannot see the connection between some of the things. Because uh, the thing is, as I told you, kind of the stages, you don't get to communicate those things in a separate channels. They are all in the same channels, consuming the content at once. And you need to figure out how you're going to communicate communicate those things. Uh, we have a question uh, from Christian Dion. How do you find where your buyers spend that time? Uh, customer research, yes. Uh, I can recommend uh, something that, that can help you guys with that. Um, and two people I know that can help you with that. One is Zineb Layachi. Uh, and the other one is Ryan Paul Gibson, who just launched, uh, let's call it a course, uh, how to run customer research interviews that don't suck. So uh, it's, uh, let me see, it has 10 parts and it goes and talk about what is a customer research interview, types of the interviews, how to set up research objectives. Who should I, you speak with? How many people should you talk to? What questions to ask? How do you find people to speak with? Uh, reaching out to people to book interviews. How do you do that? How to conduct interviews? How to organize the data? All of these things. I think it's just around like $60. All these things. Uh, and you get the copy of interview request emails. You get uh, investigative customer interview questions. You get a copy of pre-interview docs. Uh, basically you get a lot, um, and I cannot recommend, uh, Ryan Paul Gibson enough. There's an episode on the funky marketing show when Ryan was a guest, I recommend you listen, listen to that as well. I'll leave the link, uh, in the comments so you can actually go and, um, and uh, approach, approach, uh, the course, the course directly. So, uh. Yeah, let me let me add the link now in the stream as well to help you out right away. Okay, okay. I'm gonna tag Ryan Paul Gibson LinkedIn and I'm gonna add his course so you can go and Check it out. Uh, okay, we have some questions. I'll go back to them uh, later at at the end. Ugi, thanks for the question. Uh, but before we get to that, let's let's continue. So I tell you, told you that strategy without implementation doesn't actually mean anything. So 
we need to determine the communication channels we're going to use. And I usually do that by overlooking the channels that best suits me. So they suit me, not the customers. I first want to find out the, the channels that suits me the best, where I can be uh, more natural and I can, you know, do things the way I want them to do. And then I go uh, and um, see uh, what are the channels that best suit my potential clients, where do they spend time. So I focus on the channels that are intervened of these two. Um, you know, it's good that I'm able to produce different content. I can talk, uh, I can uh, create videos, I can write. So uh, from text to video and audio, I don't have to be restrained in that way, but you find what works for you and you do that. You can always do different things with content. I'm going to explain further. So I'm going all in on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm following that uh, like now less and less with Facebook. And then, of course, there's YouTube, there's Instagram, and there's Twitter. When it comes to social media, besides that, it's Medium and email, and that's all. Not many platforms, and we started with LinkedIn, then we develop all the podcast platforms, and then we move on to Medium. So LinkedIn is where my ideal clients are. If you are in B2B or you're a business professional, basically, it's a no-brainer that LinkedIn is the number one place to be, right? So... Uh, Facebook is great because uh, of the groups. Um, they have specific groups, specific communities where you can communicate things. It's the same with, with Reddit. Reddit has also some great subreddits where you can be present. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, um, you know, use it less strategic. Now we started with Instagram strategically with sharing the reels. Um, I'm going to explain what are we sharing. But uh, then Twitter is basically a place when I'm present. And it's the, the platform when I lay it all out. You know, I comment NBA, I comment basketball games uh, of partisan on Serbian. So, like, if you want to follow me for B2B, don't do that on Twitter. Or if you uh, are a basketball fan, then do it for sure. So, uh, YouTube and Medium are great for content distribution. Uh, Medium actually for syndication. So, um, and also the website, right? The website is the foundation. I started with writing the copy for the website on my own. It was optimized for conversions. Um, I got some comments where we started and created the first website for the funky marketing that, uh, you know, there's too much text. But on the other hand, I use, um, um, I use uh, tools like, uh, you know, Hotjar and some others to see how people are uh, actually uh, reacting to the content, how they are consuming it, and they were like underlying each line, like they are reading the blog. So I said, "Aha! Uh -huh. now you see, that's what I wanted to do, and that's how it goes. Because I felt like two and a half years ago, people still didn't know what is demand generation. I don't know if they know it now, uh, and those things. So I needed to educate them on the website. Now it's all structure on the blog. We have a little bit different copy on the website, but still, um, there's for some criteria a lot of uh, a lot of copy out there because it's not e-commerce it's b2b b2b marketing and i need to communicate some things that we do uh, so website is the foundation and uh, before you start with distribution of the content you need to make sure that your foundation is in a place so each channel needs a planned campaign, no matter if it's paid or organic that is followed by the workflow and the calendar so um, we do that so we don't get stuck, right? You have the guardrails and you can be creative uh, in, in the middle. Doing a lot can often turn into doing nothing and I'm trying to avoid that and I mean, you should do it. You should do it too. So um, let's see what uh, what else. Um, uh -huh, okay, no comments, let's continue. So. When we have planning set up, uh, it's time to get into the content creation phase. And in this phase, it's basically what I do right now, right? Uh, research is the most important part. If we do the research right, all other steps in creating content are relatively easy. Uh, I do the detailed research, create the outlines of each piece of content I'm creating. So long form videos, short form videos, blog articles, text posts, visuals, 
when you create templates, guardrails, as I already mentioned, you shorten the time it takes to create the content in the future. So I'm not a fan of the processes, but you know, you gotta have them. And uh, one of the guys from the team, maybe you're following him, Alexander Aric, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, basically I, I told him, you know, like, do this, uh, make sure that you are uh, writing down the journey, uh, optima have results, see if they fit, optimize, uh, support everything with examples, and then structure it in a process. And then we go and we create another process. So sh simple way to do it. Uh, so even we have all this done, you can finally sit down and do the creatives write a copy or record the videos or create visual solutions. Um, if somebody from my team is doing it, usually it gets back to me for, uh, for a review because uh, we are not, uh, you know, a huge team. We are a small team, uh, but we want to have a certain standards to set them up from the start that sets us apart from the others um, until, you know, your team is growing up that they can do things on their own. So, uh, what kind of content we are usually creating. So let's get into the couple of main pillars of the content. First one uh, are the ones that are most obvious for the uh, for majority of the companies and it's the easiest one to, to create um, and it's articles, right? Written, written content. Uh, why is that? Because a lot of people are still, you know, hesitating when it comes to recording uh, audio or uh, video and being present, being a present on the on the screen. So um, when it comes to uh, to website articles, I consider a good article the one that can present you uh, the current situation, the problem, and the solution. So I try to have, you know, the articles that are very much consumable in like three minutes. We have a little bit longer ones on the website, but uh, I'm trying to create them in a way that they are ready for distribution. So like a decision maker, is not going to spend reading, um, you know, more than three minutes of your article. In some, uh, you know, exceptions, yes, if it really blows uh, his or her mind. Right, but I'm trying to follow the pattern when creating case studies, researches, short specific articles, solving specific pain points. So I like to have a point of view that nobody else have, and to be able to kind of um, you know share things the way they are inside the company, not to go to Google and do a research and listen to Gartner or some other uh, you know huge corporations. I'm trying to write the articles about the things that we do and to have a different perspective, basically to share our perspective of the world. So in other words, thought leadership. So um, we're not focused on SEO or right? waiting for somebody to find us on Google, uh, but it also works. We get clients from the Google and started uh, to hit now. Uh, but I find long-term form articles as a great source for content when it comes to social media posts, infographics, video, etc., for repurposing content. So that's what we... Uh, think of the outcome when it comes to writing an article. Um, a practice taught me that creating videos and podcasts takes less time and the effect is almost the same with the article. I mentioned already the speed. So we can start with video and audio and craft the articles out of it. One other thing that I usually do when it comes to the articles, I didn't see anybody else doing it. Um, I write a post. On LinkedIn and I tag a couple of people that are maybe my peers or potential customers and I ask them to give their side of the things so when I uh, if there's a you know uh, an interest for that post is there's an engagement then you know I'm in the right uh, in moving in the right direction they gave me their perspective so when I turn it into the article I'm writing the article along with my ideal customers or with my peers. And I can, you know, have a lot of things that comes out of that article. Um, the other thing uh, that I have is Funky Marketing Show. Um, it has a purpose to educate it, uh, when we started. It has uh, a purpose to educate me first. You know, then it's my team, then it's the listeners. 
I start first 10 episodes where uh, I wanted to hear the story of the people um, who are working in similar positions and see what they know, how did they come up uh, to the place when they already are, um, how did they learn some things that they know, and then, you know, just to see where I fit, where's my level of knowledge and experience. And when I found out that I can talk on the same level with them, uh, then from 10th episode, basically, uh, I mo it moved into discussion. So we are discussing about things together and creating the outcome together. So sometimes uh, those are people that um, are my peers. Sometimes it's potential customers. But if you're just starting, I would recommend that you find a list of like 50 or 100 potential customers of yours, invite them to the podcast, and ask them everything that you need to ask them to try to sell them in the long run. Not in the short run, not try to finish, but creating content with your customers, it's extremely important because then they are part of the distribution as well. And they are, and they are team, aka the company that you are trying to sell to. So um, offline meetings are also an uh, extremely important part of the content. So I want to have uh, an offline thing that kind of help me spread the word inside the local community. And it gets me a chance to sit down with, with some people. We started that with 20 people, 30 people. Now it's 200 and it become a different business called Business Talks Network. Uh, you'll hear about it in the future, but basically it turned into professional networking. But it's even smaller events for like 60 people for... Um, senior professionals in business uh, and it's like bigger open events with uh, more than 200 people for everybody interested to learn more and advance in their careers and you know recording those conversations publishing them you know you give the get the offline and you you get the online versions of those events uh, so uh, now when you know that we have kind of like three content pillars, it's time when uh, when my content is ready for the distribution. So so this is the part when we when we start thinking about about distribution. We know what our uh, pillars are. How do we actually create them? Uh, what why do they exist and what we do with them? So we also know who are we talking to. Uh, but let's get. Uh, to distribution when it comes to uh, all different channels. So first of all, organic posts, right? They are the basics of the content distribution. So uh, at the moment we are only do organic, but I'm gonna tell you how our use also paid. So um, we schedule posts on LinkedIn. Uh, we used to schedule posts in, on a Facebook in, a, in our Facebook group, we don't do it anymore. Uh, we schedule posts uh, on Instagram, and we uh, we would do it on uh, on TikTok, but like as coming somebody's coming from Serbia, we cannot have the TikTok company account, so we cannot schedule the post. Ah, I need to find a solution for that. If you're listening and you know how to do it, let me know. Um, but let's go uh, from LinkedIn. So on LinkedIn. We do organic, uh, it's the most effective over there out of all platforms. So um, what we try to do is from the start, we try to see what will happen if you post, uh, you know, at least two times on my personal profile and on the personal profiles of all the people from the team. So uh, trying to keep like four hours between the two posts, those kind of things. Um, <laughs> we we got into three or four posts per day, combining like text, photos, videos, visualize audio formats, uh, you know, sometimes links. But to tell you the truth, one post per day now works the best. You don't need more than that. One post and engage with other people. So besides posting on my personal profiles, we use the feature section of my profile to post the newest articles, uh, relevant LinkedIn posts, uh, registration links, uh, for some events that we are organizing. And of course, the first thing is contact us page when somebody who is uh, educated enough and has consumed the content comes to my profile can go and schedule a call right away. So uh, another thing is 
Uh, I want to uh, emphasize the, the feature section because I think it's one of the most important sections over there. Now, of course, you have a link uh, to add to your profile as well, but feature section gives you a chance to go to the Funky Marketing website to schedule a free 30 minutes consultation call with us. It's our main CTA and this section of LinkedIn profile allows us to send people uh, from the post, check my profile at the same time to schedule a call. So we post on the Funky Marketing page as well, uh, but there we post different things, like we chop up uh, some videos from the podcast, uh, share the articles. Um, I'm gonna tell you later what we what we do with all those things. But uh, basically, we focus on the content that is created with our peers or with our customers. So we create a place on the LinkedIn page when people can go and come back uh, as a place where they can find out uh, things about B2B marketing, B2B sales, uh, B2B tech, those kind of things, because they need to go there uh, on their own and go back and go back, uh, you know. So uh, yeah, why not starting with personal account on TikTok? It's already there. It's already there. Uh, so I'm trying to, to move to the company page. So I can uh, can think about scaling it, right? So um, yeah, uh, it's coming. I think from January, the more content on LinkedIn on my personal profile is is definitely definitely coming. Uh, then Facebook, basically, you know, like we stop posting anything on the company page. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Nobody sees that. Um, Active engagement can be expected mostly in the Facebook groups uh, and on personal Facebook profiles. Uh, I use, uh, to be honest, Facebook to kind of test things out. If there's a reaction on the post, then I turn it into the LinkedIn post. I translate it into the English and I post it on LinkedIn. So that's one, let's call it hack that you can use. Um, but, uh, and it's difficult to kind of, you know, promote the articles or podcast episodes in uh, other people's communities. You can go over there and you can engage in the comments, but it's hard to you know, get them to click the link to go somewhere. And, you know, and that's the trend that is happening everywhere on LinkedIn and Facebook, on Reddit, you know. Uh, so uh, the, it's good to have your own Facebook group. Uh, small communities when you can do that or you can go there are tons of communities on slack when you can use to distribute content um, usually they have this you know shameless promotion part or linkedin part when you can actually promote linkedin posts or some some other things uh, when it comes to youtube i consider youtube like the, another social media platform uh, i post long form videos uh, recordings of the webinars we create the webinar like this one or the um, podcast episode uh, and we post the video on YouTube, I first use it to do exactly this. So to live stream the recording of the episode, then we edit the episode and we publish it on YouTube, we publish it on Anchor, which then distributed to, uh, distributes it to, to all the other platforms like Spotify, Apple, those are the main ones and some, and some others. So, um, YouTube can be a very powerful channel if you're building a brand because, uh, you know, using a tool called YouTube Buddy to actually help you analyze the um, hashtags, the, the tags, the categories, so you can see how you rank for specific things, what are the other videos that are uh, getting you the traffic, uh, and also see if your videos are popping up on Google as well in the search. So um, that's it for uh, for organic when it comes to uh, promotional posts i used to uh, do three platforms so uh, facebook and instagram video to educate people nothing else so uh, i advertise like visual audio short form videos cut from the long form ones case studies research studies sometimes you know articles made for distribution and consumption which are like up to three minute read the idea was to educate people so they can look for a solution when they're ready to buy uh, then basically and transfer that to uh to linkedin have done that also uh on linkedin it works very well uh you need to have of 
you know, I usually go for these kind of things to uh, consume the content in the feed. I go with awareness campaign uh, when I can just, uh, you know, get people to, to consume the content in the feed. You need to go with at least, I think it's not changed, like <clears throat> $25 per day uh, to kind of get uh, the results. I mean, you can, you can invest more for sure, but that's like the minimum to kind of get something. And it's interesting how it works, you know, like people consume the content, consume, consume, consume. You don't know that they are consuming, but then the guy comes in, like uh, he likes three of your posts that are on um, uh, advertised, uh, then comes to your profile, checks it out, sends you a message, send you, hey, man, I read this. Or I read these three articles um, on LinkedIn. I checked out your website and I'm ready to have a conversation with you. That's how it actually happens. So you need to educate people until they're ready. When they're ready, they will come to you. So um, live videos like this to live stream the recordings of the episode are extremely important because, you know, I get questions. I get the feedback from the people. I get to appear uh, in, um, I mean, in their feed. You know, um, wherever I do the live stream, if I have a guest, then the the, the their audience will also see um, will also see the post, see the the stream. So uh, yeah, it gives you uh, an extra an extra exposure. So uh, let's see what else. Uh, what else uh, did I forgot? Uh, yeah. So, um, um, one thing that is, uh, extremely interesting is email marketing. People say it doesn't work. I think it's working very well. Uh, right now we are using it just to kind of, um, as another channel to kind of, um, syndicate, uh, the articles already published on our website. So basically we copy paste the article, uh, and share it with our, uh, with, uh, with our um, subscribers. We do that because we found out that they are not actually clicking when we want to take them out to promote the episode or whatever. So we said, okay, let's give to them uh, in their email. So now we get people who are actually reading your articles. And that's all that I need from there. Uh, back in the days, uh, I had two people actually running uh, the personalized newsletter that can be interesting to you, like uh, Martin, um, who was part of my team, and Linda. I, I told him, like, Martin, your name is now going to be Master Martin. You're not Martin anymore. I'm going to start the discussion uh, in the newsletter as you are talking to your friend and go and have that style, conversational style of writing, storytelling. Then the second email comes from Linda, who is kind of a continuation of Mart what Martin wrote, then Martin again, then Linda, and it was kind of interesting uh, combo that people really liked. So that's also an idea that you can that you can use. Uh, but make sure that it's something uh, that is useful for people, no matter if it's uh, personalized or just like uh, sharing of the article. Um, and also think, think about that. We don't do direct outreach. Uh, except we want to connect a specific person or a specific company to get them to the podcast. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, I don't know, like, um, yeah, basically those are the things when we are using it. Uh, syndication is kind of interesting thing. And I think a lot of people, you know, think about it in a way that they don't need, then confuse distribution and syndication. Okay, distribution is when you take a piece of content, you chunk it up in smaller pieces and distribute it as separate content pieces. Syndication is when you take the whole post, the whole video, and just republish it somewhere else in a full. So um, we post articles on LinkedIn. We used to uh, do it now, you know, from time to time, but we take just a small portion of the article post it uh, on LinkedIn uh, just to kind of get people interested and to get them to go to the website. Uh, newsletters on LinkedIn are extremely important. Uh, I didn't want to get into that yet because everybody else 
we're coming with a newsletter, right? But that's a great way to uh, actually do the content syndication and promote. The article Medium turns out to be a great platform for us. Uh, we get like uh, from 100 to 300 people reading uh, our content on Medium. We publish it on my Medium profile uh, and we got... Uh, because the articles are good, we got the attention from a couple of publishers like Startup Stash and some others that reached out to me, um, told me, would you like to be, uh, you know, one of the people that's writing for us? And the way it works, Medium is so simple. Uh, and I'm like, why people are not using this? So with one click, you can import the article from your website to Medium and then just check it out before you publish it or actually after you publish it you have um, the option on the right side if you are already added uh, as a publisher for like startup stash or some others you have the option with one click to add your article from medium to uh, to startup stash or any other publication platform or medium right so it also appears on their website and uh they decide if they're going to accept it or no. If they accept it, usually they accept it because uh, they want to have great content on the publication. And then they reshare those things um, on their social media channels. They actually promote it. And when people click on it, it doesn't go to the publishing platform. It go to your Medium post. So basically, you get the free promotion from different publication platforms on Medium. We even got so far, like in the last two months, like two uh, ideal clients coming and saying that they have read uh, the article on Medium and they came to our website to schedule a call. How cool is that, right? So uh, the thing, people who are afraid of like, um, um, you know that it's a double content, that it's copy, it's not, because uh, Medium works in a different way. So it's actually recommendable that you have the article on your blog, on your website, and the article of Medium, uh, the same one with the same headline, because like if you have one on, the, on your blog and somebody uh, creates the better one with the same headline, uh, with the same keyword in the headline on Medium, they will actually rank better uh, than your website. There's a chance for that to happen. You know, yes, I was surprised as probably you are hearing this now when, uh, when somebody else told me that, right? So, uh, let's, let's move on and see, uh, talk more about repurposing content. Okay. So we tend to republish certain pieces of content after optimizing it, you know, like based on number of reads, click through rate, other updates, and, uh, you know, uh, or during a relevant campaign, you know, when I can use some pieces of content previously created for another purpose. And this can also be called a content upgrade, right? So uh, you see how are people coming to the website, what they are clicking, are those the things that you actually wanted them to type in when they found your website, you check those things out and you update them. Reformatting uh, is great. So we basically use those four, uh, three, uh, pieces of content to create more content out of it. So when we record a podcast, uh, we're recording the video version and uploading it on YouTube. We get, usually it's four to five short pieces um, from that long uh, video, from that episode, sometimes it's even eight or nine. Uh, and we uh, share them on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram. TikTok, uh, and you know that's what we do out of every long form video. We get four or five pieces of visualized audio content uh, out of it as well, just so we can have an option to kind of share the visualized audio or the video. Um, we use long form articles, case studies, researches, and we reformat them as text posts for LinkedIn. So we get, uh, you know, we change them a little bit. We go inside it, but as I already told you, we have distribution in mind when we are creating a piece of content and it affects the distribution because we don't need to have like additional preparation of the content. They are already ready for to be distributed. So we use long form articles, case studies, researches, 
uh, and we can reformat them as visual posts for Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We can use one part of it and create a, a small video, or we can use one part of it um, to kind of visualize it with uh, with a photo. So do different things. You know, it's never end. You always keep repurposing the content. Um, after we're done with a, with a long form video, record a podcast like this one, we're uploading it, uh, audio recordings to Anchor, a platform that distributes the episode to all the other podcasting platform. We upload video recording on YouTube uh, and each YouTube post has a link to the website. Um, now we are restructuring the website, but we will basically have um, a long form videos on YouTube and embed them uh, the link into an article on the website with the same topic. So we actually, you know, merge the video, the audio and the text. It also works good for your website. Um, and this is how we distribute it. So not uh, usually goes as a YouTube link, but as a website article. Uh, and it does good for the SEO. Each website post with an embedded YouTube link has CTA. So, you know, contact us, schedule a call. It is there to give people a choice, not to make them do, you know, something that they are, um, aren't ready to do. Uh, and the important thing is that we add smaller pieces inside other articles not related to those that are created from the podcast episode, webinars, or different events. So uh, they tend to give us, uh, to give people a chance to go and get more deep into the topic. So um, we're using long detail articles to create social media posts and further promote the content because it's not necessarily uh, our wish to for them to come to the website and read the article. They can read it inside the feed. So uh, because for people, it's more comfortable to spend time with their already are instead of just clicking, you know, can you guarantee that any piece of content is actually that good that you can tell them if you go click the link and read this article, you will never find anything, um, you know, that is mm, like this. It's a unique piece of content. Ah, no, not many people can say that. Not many companies can actually do it. So uh, then re-promoting content. From time to time, we're re-promoting content that caused reaction, engagement, depending on the goal. So we are watching what are people are reacting to. We are not the judge of the content that we are creating. It's the audience. It's the customers. It's our peers. So we watch the reactions. Uh, we watch which piece of content, which posts actually, you know, cause reactions and engagement. And the thing is that when you promote a piece of content once, you can do it again and again and again and again and again. You don't always need another piece of content. And this one has social proof and it will do better with your audience. So you already know that they are interesting in the topic you can go. People don't remember things. People forget things. Nobody cares. If it's something performed well, do it again. Uh, after we're done with all that, I mentioned we break things down like single piece of content into content series and content hubs, emails into email sequences, and you get the point. So we merge all of it and be built to it. At the end comes the most important uh, things long term, and it is the optimization. So when the content is out, we watch reactions, when we optimize to make it better. And I don't advise uh, you to measure like every single piece of content. Just create it with a goal in mind and optimize accordingly. So what does it mean? What do you actually need to optimize? Like the headline, subheadline, intro and description, visual templates, uh, readability, uh, shareability, what else? Uh, images, CTAs, internal links. Those are the things that you constantly need to optimize. We can optimize more things, but I mean, there's no need. Of course, you know, like at least for now. Um, so this is how we do it. Uh, and to tell you the truth, this only thing without uh, paid thing got us um, to close 39 clients and uh, get to around 25K MRR in 18 months. Then we moved to the scale-ups. Now it's a little bit different, but uh, it works 
very well because you every piece of content that you create and then you distribute or uh, syndicate Bex actually has one thing in mind and to help the customers get to the next level not to buy right now not to do specific thing right now but to get to the next level for some of it it's to learn that there's a problem for some of it to learn that there is a solution for some of it uh, you know, to find out about you through their peers, through somebody they're following, you know, for some of them to create awareness and for some of them to buy, right? People go to the extremes. Like it's not only, you know, awareness or brand, like uh, educate, 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 or it's not only buy, 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 buy. You need to go and do things in the middle. You need both. So um, we could have close even more clients, we could have earned more, we could have grown faster, but I don't think of the funky marketing as like a classic agency. We are a team that actually brings revenue to our clients with cost-effective strategies, consultancy. We are fast, responsible, flexible, and focused on results. And we care, you know, to be able to do that, we need to pay attention to every client and to look at our business as a client as well. That's extremely important. That's if you look at your business as a client, this is where you find uh, a time to work on your content and to work on your company. You know, that's that switch that you need to make. So uh, this is all that I had uh, for you today. Um, Ugi shared uh, the article in the comments. Uh, I'm going to try to edit uh, also to the when we actually publish the episode to the podcast, if you're listening to it, you probably have it in the description, but how to do an ICP research for content marketing purposes and find the content marketing fit. Great topic, Ugi. Uh, I'm glad uh, to see that you're writing about this stuff. Uh, and, you know, I'll go through it. Uh, it's a detailed article, so I cannot do it right now on the stream, but I'll do it. I'll certainly leave it for the people to uh, actually go through it. And I will leave it as a resource, additional resource for uh, for them to kind of um, check it out and use it, right? That's, that's the purpose. So um, guys, thanks a lot for being with me. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, Maybe I will record tomorrow, maybe during the next week, but I'm going to do like these around 20 solo episodes to kind of uh, get to the core of things. The next the next one is kind of, uh, it's going to be the one that is actually the continuation of this one, uh, meaning how to shorten sales cycle and increase your revenue. So I'm going to try to make it simple for you, to make it easy to chew and understand. So make sure that you ring a bell of my on my LinkedIn profile so you can get notified when I'm live, so you can ask questions. Or if you're listening to this uh, live stream and you already have questions, feel free to reach out to me and to ask them, and I will uh, answer them uh, during the recording of the next episode. Uh, I hope it was useful. Um, so yeah, let's go uh, and let's create B2B machines out of uh, your businesses as well. You know, go back to the beginning of the episode, as I'm always telling you, uh, go through everything that I already said. Uh, there's an article about this on the funkymarketing.net. Uh, uh, inside our resources, inside our blog, so you can go ahead, check it out. There's a visualization of it. I didn't want to share it. Uh, so you can, you know, imagine things and start taking, but you can go over there, you will find it. Or you go on YouTube and you type in how to create a B2B marketing machine. You will see that I have a video over there for you where I zoom in on the things and you can see like in the middle, it's content pillars. On one hand is the distribution or one hand is the repurposing, so you can see how it goes and have the more clear picture of it. Uh, now is the time for me to finish um, my coffee and to go and do more work. Guys, have a nice weekend. Talk to you the other day. Keep it funky.